Hey guys, welcome back to Ostrich Investing. Today we're going to take a look at a company called Highliner Foods. It's a branded foods product company and based on that you'd expect the uh, business to be quite stable. But recently the share price performance has been anything but. And with the dividend now yielding close to 8%, I was curious to learn more. So Highliner Foods, as you can see by the map here, they've, they've outlined their key areas of manufacturing, distribution, uh, but it's, it, it's famously known for fish sticks, uh, the Highliner brand uh, highlighted right here. But they do have uh, both retail and food service products. 75% uh, of their business is from branded products as opposed to private label. And they offer 30 different types of seafood, but salmon, shrimp, and cod uh, account for about 60% of revenue. So Highliner Foods trades on the TSX under the uh, symbol HLF. Um, you can see over the last five years that the stock back in 2016 was up around $26 and it's currently trading below eight. So the stock's fallen quite a ways um, and $8 a share is a price that it hasn't seen since uh, 2011. Stock currently pays a 58 cent dividend, which works out to about an 8% yield. So this video is gonna look at the financial overview, uh, the recent news, and then we'll conclude with some key considerations for the stock. So with that, let's jump into it. So at their website for investor relations, I have pulled up their 2017 annual report here. And if we just scroll down to page two, they don't give us a long-term financial summary, but they do give us the past two years. So we'll just run through a couple of the, the key items right now. You can see that revenues have gone up between 2016 and 2017. Revenues are up about 10%. Uh, however, EBITDA is down close to 20%. And earnings and EPS, let's find our, our EPS number here. Earnings per share down about 7%. Another thing that I noted here on this table is the book value per share is $8. So with the stock trading at about $7.90, and, and uh, this stock is actually trading below uh, book value. One other point, they, they give a few charts here on the five-year data. And as we can see down in the bottom right on the adjusted earnings per share, um, it presented it in a unique fashion, but you can sort of see if you start at 2013, EPS over time, with the exception of 2016, has actually been trending downwards. So uh, that's obviously a key point to consider and look into. Uh, so that's it for the annual report in terms of financial overview. They do have an investor presentation uh, that has a couple of good long-term charts. So if we just go over to page 27, this gives you a 10 year sales history and shows the acquisitions that the company's made uh, by year. And in general, you can see revenue moving up and to the right. Uh, that being said, I'd love to look at this on an organic basis because this would include the revenue that they've acquired as well. So uh, this chart would probably look uh, quite different on an organic basis. And it also shows you the sales in terms of pounds of seafood. If we go to the next slide, it does the exact same thing, but for EBITDA. And here's where you could see a little bit of a different story while revenue is moving up and to the right. Uh, EBITDA has been flat to down, uh, particularly 2017 was a, was a bad year. You can see margins dropping off. This is already a low margin business. And EBITDA of 66.1. Uh, million in 2017. And then the last one, here's the 10 year EPS and return on equity history. So historically, actually, the return on equity is quite nice here. Um, historically, return on equity is somewhere between 15 and 20%. Again, 2017, not a great year. Uh, so that drops down. Um, and you can see that trend that we noticed on the financial summary. 2013 EPS is the was sort of a peak outside of 2016 
and it's really sort of been trending down. 2016 was sort of an anomaly, I guess, compared to the other, the other five. So that's the financial overview. When it comes to detailed review, there's two key items I want to point out. The first being uh, leverage and the second being working capital. So for leverage, um, the business does have a fair amount of debt on the balance sheet. So let's jump to slide 20 here, which gives us a good overview. Here we go. So you can see that debt to EBITDA is currently at 5.6 times, which is quite high, particularly for a non-utility business. And they've shown here that their target is to get that down to three times. So um, probably a combination of taking on debt to acquire businesses and then with EBITDA decreasing as opposed to increasing, that's what's resulted in, in a, a, a fairly high leverage ratio. So I wanted to jump into the annual report just to take a look at that. And I believe if we go to page 82, we can get to the financial notes. Here we go. So on the long-term debt side, there's about $337 million of debt. And as you read the note here, it's a term loan facility with an interest rate of LIBOR plus three and a quarter, and it matures on April 24th, 2021. So they've got a little under three years to uh, before they need to refinance that. Another thing, they don't actually talk about um, covenants here. Uh, quarterly principal payments of a million dollars are required, so nothing, nothing overly meaningful relative to the size of the business. Um, but they don't talk about any covenants, if at all, so that would be a question that I'd want to ask of management just to make sure, given the debt levels here, that they aren't um, uh, close to violating any financial covenants. And working capital is the second key one that I wanted to highlight here. If we just back up to the financial statements quickly. And we'll just go to the statement of cash flows. For a business like this, uh, we'll see their inventory in a moment. But you can see that between 2016 and 2017, uh, there's significant working capital needs in this business. So in 2016, it ended up being a $25 million source of funds because their working capital reduced uh, between the start of the year and the end of the year. Whereas in 2017, it was actually a $48.9 million use of funds. And uh, that's because the working capital needs increased over the course of the year. So when you compare it to their cash flows from operations, it could and in 2017 was a fairly significant number. So when you're thinking about this business, just something to keep in mind. Um, and we'll also just go to page 38, I believe. There we go. So here's a table um, that outlines it in the annual report. And you can see um, inventory is just a massive number. Another thing to consider for this business is that inventory is obviously, in this case, um, a food product, so frozen seafood. Um, so one of the key aspects of managing this business would be controlling that inventory, avoiding any sort of spoiled product. Um, and I just thought that it was worth highlighting given the, given the size of the overall uh, working capital needs of the business. In terms of recent results, uh, we'll start off by going back to the investor presentation on slide 26. They do a good job here of just highlighting uh, some of the difficulties that the business has had over the past year or two. The first being a product recall in 2017, something that uh, would be a nightmare for any food company. So they talk about the financial impact in terms of sales and EBITDA here, but there's also, as they point out in the third bullet, additional impact related to reputation and lost sales opportunities uh, when you lose a little bit of trust in the market. Um, so that's the product recall. Another key one, and I think from a financial impact even greater, uh, is the Rubicon Resources acquisition that they made in, in 2017. They purchased this business for about $100 million, uh, and it was supposed to have EBITDA of $16 million. And they added, they financed most of it with debt. Um, 
fast forward to today, that business has lost one of its major customers. So within the span of the first year of acquiring the business, they've lost a, a key customer and Highliner no longer expects EBITDA contribution of 16 million. So while they paid, I guess about seven times EBITDA for, for that business, in reality, if you, if you look at where they're tracking today, uh, it's less than half of what they would have expected from an EBITDA perspective. So clearly this is an acquisition that has not gone um, as well as they, they would have hoped. Um, if we jump just over to the Q2 report, uh, another key thing, if we go page seven, here we go. Appointment of a new president and CEO. So given the product recall, and the Rubicon acquisition, the previous CEO is out. Um, the uh, former CEO, longtime CEO, who was still sitting on the board of directors, came back in on an interim basis. They've now, since uh, May of 2018, hired a new CEO, Rod Heppenstall, and you can see below his background. Uh, he does come from uh, retail and food sort service experience and in frozen potato products. So while not seafood, it seems to be a pretty good fit in terms of um, his background. But always want to point that out. And lastly, if we just go back to the presentation, there's two other key items here, page 22. So in terms of 2018 outlook, they highlight uh, some cost cutting initiatives. So they're looking to optimize the structure and realign the company by core function as opposed to geography. And they're also looking at uh, some layoffs and, um, and cost synergies and taking out about $10, $10 million in annualized cost savings in the business by 2019. And then the last key piece is just talking about potential tariffs. Uh, so. It, potential 25% tariffs on certain seafood imported into the US from China. So you can see here in, in the bullet, uh, bullet number four, I believe, the current company currently purchases its seafood raw materials from more than 20 countries around the world, including from the US to meet consumer demand. A portion of this material is imported into China for primary processing and then exported to the US for sale and secondary processing. So, uh, they would be impacted. Not all of their seafood uh, would be subject to tariffs. So what I guess what they're saying here is not all of it goes through China, but some of it most definitely does. And we'd have to monitor um, the situation on these tariffs. We know that this is a low margin business. We saw EBITDA margin sub 10%. So a 25% tariff would be, um, would be difficult uh, for this business. So obviously I think their plan uh, would be to try and pass on as much of that to the end consumer if possible. So that's the background on in terms of the financial overview, recent results. So maybe we we'll jump back and just look at some key considerations for the stock. So if we think about what we've read, strengths, obviously, this is a branded food products company, and it does have a long, a long track record. Uh, they've got solid operational and acquisition track record up until recently. So we know that 2016, 17 were difficult, uh, sorry, 2017 was difficult. Um, but if you look previous to that, this was a business that was well known for being able to make strategic acquisitions, integrate them. And so Rubicon is definitely the exception. Um, but let's give them credit for having a pretty strong track record. And lastly, dividend of 8% is actually well covered by current earnings. Uh, so, it, you know, if EPS continues on a downward trend, well, that might change. But right now, the dividend does look um, uh, like it's, well, it is well covered um, by earnings on a payout ratio basis. Risks, there's quite a few here. Uh, the first being leverage. There's no question there's a lot of debt on the balance sheet, about $370 million of debt. Uh, that they need to uh, pay down and we know that based on their investor presentation that's a key focus of theirs is to do that. Uh, second, food contamination and recalls. Uh, we saw that in 2017 so as you can 
kind of see 2017 was just that awful year that you you never want to see um, bad acquisition product recall um, I, I haven't gone back years upon years just to see what their track record is but given the, the history and and how long the that Highliner has been in business I would expect they have a fairly good track record in this regard um, but they are dealing with a recent product recall and of course there is risk for another recall in a business like this. Third, declining sales for the breaded and battered product. Um, so we didn't talk about it too much before, but they're very well known for fish sticks and uh, uh, sort of fried fish products. They, they do have non um, breaded and battered product as well. Um, but even though they don't break it out, I would hazard a guess and we would believe based on the results we've seen that that breaded and battered product is likely um, showing negative revenue growth and that would be a key question I'd have uh, for management would just be trying to understand the sales split between breaded and battered product versus um, non and looking at the organic revenue growth of the business number four new management um, it does look like uh, the new CEO comes in with a pretty good pedigree and background but anytime you've got new management uh, there's risk there we do know in 2018, I, I believe two other C-suite executives have left the company. So there is a bit of a management shakeup going on here. And lastly, uh, the potential tariffs. And, and that's sort of a wild card that, that I'll be honest, is tough to really quantify um, from my perspective. But this would definitely impact their business. So key drivers, consumption of seafood. Uh, and then within that consumption of seafood, so globally, are we are we eating more protein, more seafood? And then within that, for Highliner specifically, what would be the split between fresh versus frozen? They obviously specialize in frozen, and look at breaded versus non. Uh, otherwise, normalized EBITDA, and I've just put it bluntly here, return to growth. So um, you know, the EBITDA of 66 million in 2017, no question, was well below what they would have expected. And then lastly, debt reduction. So sort of top line consumption of seafood, profitability, getting EBITDA moving back in the right direction, and then debt reduction. So those are some of the key considerations. And with that, um, let's move into some illustrative scenarios for discussion. Again, not exhaustive, but we'll present sort of our bull, base, and bear case scenarios. On the bull side, I've shown normalized EBITDA returning to about 100 million. So we know it was about 70 million last year. Um, they're looking at 10 million of uh, cost savings, plus this sort of shows EBITDA margins reverting back to where they were historically. And if you sort of add all those things up, uh, we give them uh, the benefit of about 100 million in, in normalized EBITDA. The dividends maintained, and then we really want to come down to about a, to a free cash flow number uh, with any remaining free cash flow to pay down debt. I've assumed cap capex of twenty million a year, and uh, EVD EBITDA multiple of nine times. And what I've done here is sort of look two years out. So two years giving the business enough time to pay down a little debt a little bit, and so I've calculated the implied share price out two years. Um, if they were to return or achieve normalized EBITDA of 100 million, and in this scenario at nine times EBIT EBITDA, the implied share price would be $20 a share. Uh, so would have significant upside relative to current levels. Base case, normalized EBITDA of 80 million sort of takes the 70 million that they're tracking to right now, gives them credit for the 10 million of cost savings, but doesn't bake any any. Um, gross margin expansion back into it. Again, similar assumptions here on CapEx uh, and with the remaining free cash flow to pay down debt. With normalized EBITDA of 80 million, we're obviously not gonna see the same uh, growth. So we've compressed the multiple a little bit, EBITDA EBITDA of seven and a half times. And again, out two years with the debt reduction, that implies a share price of $9.70. And of course, you'd be clipping uh, close to an eight percent dividend yield while you wait. Now lastly, on the bear side, um, I've done normalized EBITDA of 70 million. 
At 70 million of EBITDA, I believe that the dividend can still be maintained. So we've kept that in there. And I guess fair to point out that this is not an extreme bear scenario. I haven't really contemplated the tariffs in in my scenarios. And you know, if you were to assume 25% tariffs on any product going through China and margin reduction, we could envision a scenario that's that's worse than what I've presented here. Um, but I've just decided to leave the tariffs out for the purposes of, of our discussion right now. And so assuming 70 million of EBITDA, which is really what they're tracking to now outside of any cost savings or margin improvement, um, if that's the case, you know maybe the multiple compresses to six times. So about a six times EV to EBITDA. Out two years, the implied share price is $3.60, which would be you know over 50% downside from its current levels of just under $8 a share. And I think the only thing I wanted to add in here on the bear scenario is that obviously if um, if this scenario were to play out and the share price would would drive down to you know four dollars or less per share, I'd have to imagine that the board would look at strategic alternatives and a potential sale of the business, and in a control sales scenario, um, so getting seven and a half times EBITDA as opposed to six you know, your bear side could be limited to $7 a share. So that would be, you know, if the business was sold. So that's, um, that's the triple B, the bull, the base, the bear. Let me know what you think. Should we be more concerned about low margins in the industry? When was the last time you had fish sticks? Uh, I actually did go out and buy a pack of fish, fish sticks as part of uh, the uh, due diligence for this. And I hadn't had them in years. Definitely not healthy, but they were quite good. Um, let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Be sure to check us out at ostrichinvesting.com or on Twitter at ostrich underscore invest. Yeah, we'll be back soon with more content, but until then, happy investing and don't bury your head in the sand. Hey.